morning and uh, good to see uh, you know when I think I believe the last time I was here was two years ago maybe maybe two and a half three years ago and uh, it's just good to see the church growing and to see the progression uh, the way things are moving amen and uh, I like to see you know the Bible said that uh, uh, concerning the church that the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church of God and that promise is as true today as it was the day the Lord gave that amen and uh, so it's good to see what the Lord's doing here in this area if you have your Bibles this morning I want you to turn to Psalm 12 verse 1 uh, this is my life verse and I want to speak. He asked, uh, the pastor asked me last night to speak to the men and the young men here, and uh, right away my mind went to this verse. My boys uh, are probably thinking, we know what dad's going to preach on or teach on, but you do not. All right, and uh, same verse, but a different uh, thought process here. But Psalm 12, verse number 1, uh, and uh, the Bible says here, help Lord. So we find the psalmist crying out to the Lord for help. Uh, what's, what's he crying out to God for? Is he, is he a decrying or pleading to God because of the state of the nation? Is he talking about uh, terrible things that are happening within homes? Is he talking about churches compromising? That's not what he's talking about. Uh, he, he, uh, his, his cry out is, Help, Lord, for the godly man ceaseth, for the faithful fail from among the children of men. And uh, his cry to God uh, is for God. He's crying out to God. He's asking God to raise up godly men. He's asking God to raise up faithful men. And I want to talk about that a little bit this morning, uh, what it means to be a godly, faithful man. Uh, and so uh, I just want to try to, you know, the pastor asked me, he said, just talk to the guys from your heart. And that's what I want to do. We may do a little talking. Uh, we'll do a lot of teaching. We may even slip into a little bit of preaching. Amen. And somebody says, well, what's the difference between teaching and preaching? Teaching is indoctrinating people in the principles and the truths of God's Word. Preaching is where you're making an appeal uh, to the people of God concerning a particular uh, matter that, 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 that they would make a change in their lives, in the course of their lives, uh, so on and so forth, uh, that we would t uh, turn from the direction we're going and uh, go with God. Amen. And uh, so it's making an appeal to the people of God. But the psalmist here in Psalm 12, 1, he's crying out and he's pleading to God. God, uh, that God would raise up godly, faithful men. He said, the godly man ceaseth. There's a famine of godly men in his day and uh, time that he lived. And if there's ever a time in America where we need a generation of godly men, now is that time. We are desperate in this nation uh, for godly men, for faithful men. So let's go to the Lord in a word of prayer, and uh, then we'll begin to look through the scriptures and examine the kind of man that God would have uh, ever every one of us in this room to be. Amen. So let's pray. Lord, I pray now that you'd bless the teaching of thy word this morning. I pray you'd bless uh, as Angie teaches her class, as various Sunday school teachers are downstairs teaching classes. And then Lord, as we teach here, Lord, I pray that thy spirit would take the principles of thy word and uh, Lord God, just connect with our spirit and our hearts, Lord. And uh, I pray that we'd be very receptive, uh, very responsive, Lord, uh, to what you would teach us this morning and that each one of us would grow in our walk with you you, Lord, and grow uh, as a spiritual man. So for what you do, we're going to thank you and praise you. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So I know some of you are wondering, you know, Brother Upman's a missionary to Africa, to West African folks and whatnot. And so let me just say this. Uh, we'll talk about that in the afternoon service. So you need to come back, amen, and to be a part of that service. And we'll be uh, explaining our ministry. I do wish that uh, our mission DVD presentation was done. It will be finished today sometime, but I, I, I'm not sure that it will be done in time for the 2 o'clock service. Uh, but but uh, Pastor said that uh, y'all will show it on Wednesday. So we have a man that's putting the presentation together for us, and and uh, he's trying to get it done this afternoon. But he said I have no guarantees that I'll have it finished for you by this afternoon. So anyhow, uh, uh, but we'll we'll talk more about that and what the Lord's leading us to do in that two o'clock service. Uh, so this morning I want to give you some thoughts again from the Scripture on uh, the kind of man that God desires for you and I to be. And I want to challenge you. Uh, I am purposefully I'm going to be quoting a lot of Scripture. 
scripture as I teach. I, I like to do that. I'm not going to be calling as many scripture references this morning on purpose because I want you to take notes. I want you to stay awake. I want you to think. And, and as I come to a place where I quote a scripture, man, write those, you know, that down. And then I, I could give you the reference so we could turn to it. But I want you to write this, maybe the passage of scripture down, a part of the verse down, and then go home this afternoon or this evening and look it up and study it for yourself. Amen. And uh, don't, don't let the lesson stop when the Sunday school hour comes to a close this morning. Amen. Go home and study these principles for yourself from the Word of God. Find the scriptures and do a study yourself. And I think that'll be very profitable uh, to each one of us. Now, uh, before we get into the outline of what I want to give you this morning, and I got up early this morning, I was praying about, Lord, what do you want me to bring to the men uh, preaching and teaching from my heart? And uh, so I jotted these thoughts down uh, this morning. Thank God for y'all's nice prophet's chamber downstairs. And man, it was early and it was a little bit cool. And so I just turned the light on beside the bed and I just sat up in the bed and put the pillow behind my head. And I got my iPad, just so nice to be able to write notes down and just started typing away and, uh, and just had a good time with the Lord. My wife and Mikai were over there sleeping and just had a good time uh, with the Lord. Amen. And uh, so, uh, and, and, and putting these down. But I sure hope that you'll uh, consider these thoughts today. So before we get into the outline, I want to give you two comments uh, first uh, as we get into this subject of a spiritual man. And the first comment that I really uh, feel it's necessary uh, to make is, uh, before we even talk about being spiritual men, God is looking for men who will be men. We are living not only in a famine of spiritual men, but we're living in a generation where there's a famine of just men. Uh, God created men and God created women. And things that are different are not the same. Amen. And uh, men are, we're way different than women. And women are way different than men. And I'm thankful for that. Amen. I'm glad that God made me a man. I, I, pro, I am very thankful for that. I am glad that God made my wife a woman. Amen. And we're two very different beings. And I want to, I want to speak to you men, and especially you young men, in this part of the country uh, and, and in rural settings. It doesn't seem to be as much as an issue as in city settings and more liberal parts of the country. But man, we go into churches, and I, I hate to say it, but there we have a generation of soft men. We have a generation of uh, girly guys, all right? And there's nothing, there's nothing uh, in, you know, the, these men that are effeminate. They're, there's, you know, they, they, they want to push that. A society's pushing that upon us today. Uh, you know, I mean, all the way to the nth degree of effeminacism, which leads to, you know, the sodomite lifestyle. And uh, they call it gay pride. There's nothing proud about uh, a man being effeminate. And, and so I want to challenge uh, each one of you here uh, this morning uh, to be men. Uh, we, we don't have to, we don't have, and I'm not, I'm not trying to be smart. I'm not trying to be ugly and the Lord knows it. But God is, God needs a generation of men today. We don't need a generation of sissies. God knows we've already got plenty of them out there. Amen. We need men. Amen. We need men. We need boys that understand God made me a man and a man is what I will be. All right. And uh, so God created a man uh, to love, uh, to lead, to guide and to guard. That, all of those come into the purpose for why God created us. God, wants, uh, God would tell men that our husbands love your wives. Amen. Uh, God wants us to lead. That's, that's a part of your makeup. That's, that's how God has uh, uh, engineered you. God has engineered men to be leaders. And Paul would tell Timothy the things which thou hast heard of me. So here's a spiritual leader talking to another spiritual leader. He said the things which thou hast heard of me, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. Amen. And so we are to be leaders, teaching leaders of leaders. Amen. It's, it's, it's our job as men to lead and to guide and to guard. God, God's put that in us to, uh, to guard uh, those that listen. Uh, it's a sad day in a nation uh, when there's a troubled time and men run and leave the women and children defenseless. Uh, uh, it's, it's our job to, to guide and to guard, to be protectors, amen, of that which God and those uh, whom God's entrusted uh, to our watch care. And so we have a famine of just men. So, so I want to I talk about being a spiritual man in just a minute, but I want to say uh, we need some men that'll just be men, all right? Uh, there's something to that. We're living in a soft, uh, weak 
mushy generation when it comes to men. And I want to tell you, that's not pleasing to the Lord at all. Uh, one of the things that God lists over in Corinthians, here's one of those verses that you can study later on. You, you go find the verse on your own. I just told you it's in Corinthians. But God said, such were some of you. And God talked, and in the list where He said, such were some of you, He's talking about folks that He saved by His grace. And one of the things that He mentions in that list is effeminate men. Uh, men who are effeminate. And so we don't want to be uh, that kind of an individual. Webster defines effeminate as having the qualities of the female sex. Uh, I don't want to have the qualities of the female sex, all right? I am a man. That's what I want to have the qualities of the male sex, all right? That's who God created uh, me to be. Uh, he describes it as soft or delicate to an unmanly degree. That's how Webster defines it. A uh, tender, womanish, okay? And so you are in this class this morning. You, you were instructed to stay in here because you are of the male gender, all right? And the ladies went to the next class over, all right? And I have no idea what Angie's teaching them, but I guarantee she's not teaching this lesson, all right? This is for men, all right? Now, uh, now I want to say this. God doesn't want you to be effeminate. And sometimes people get things mixed up in their mind a little bit. Uh, you know, it's, you know, meek. Does God want us as men to be meek? Yes. Meekness is not weakness. Meekness is not effeminate, all right? Uh, does God want us to be gentle? Gentleness is a fruit of the Spirit, yes. There's nothing unmanly about being gentle, okay? Easy to be entreated. Uh, so, yeah, kind and considerate, yes. God wants men to be gentlemen, amen. He wants us to be kind and considerate, absolutely. Effeminate? A thousand times no. God does not want that. Now, now, uh, the Bible would teach us in the New Testament that one of the sins that God saved men wa uh, from was effeminacy. Paul would tell uh, young Timothy, quit ye like what? Men, quit ye like men. Be strong, all right? That, that's something that's characteristic. Strength, strong. Uh, you know, the Bible says the glory of a young man is what? His strength, all right? And uh, the glory of a woman is what? What's the Bible say? Yeah, we've got that turned around. You, you, you travel across this country, you see young women working out, wanting to be strong, and young women getting nice long, or young men getting nice long hairdos and perms. And, and uh, Lester Oloff, years ago, he preached a message, the mule walked on in 1969, and uh, he preached against everything in that message. But, but, uh, but, but I will say this, he, he made a statement, he said, it's a sad day in America uh, when women begin to get their hair cut, and men begin to get, uh, uh, men are starting to get their hair done, amen? And, uh, and, and, and he was talking, that was like 50 years ago, and he was decrying what he saw as effeminacy in that day, all right? And uh, our, our, our glory, guys, is not in our hair, all right? It's supposed to be in our strength. Go do some push-ups, work out, be a man, all right? And that's what God wants for you, I promise you that. Now, secondly, God is interested in our development as men because God's given us three institutions on this planet. One's called the home, one's called the church, and one's called the government. And it's God's desire that men lead in each of those institutions. Amen. That's God's desire. God desires for a man to lead his home. Now my hat goes off, and, and, and a woman whose husband has died, or whose husband is a deadbeat, my hat goes off when she takes up the leadership for the sake of those children. Amen. I respect her. In a nation uh, where there's a famine of men, I thank God when God raises up a, a JL. Amen. Uh, when God raises up a woman, as we see in the Old Testament several times He did. Uh, I thank the Lord for that. Amen. But I'm, I'm telling you God's perfect will is for men to lead and so God's interested in you God has a purpose for each of your lives not just as a man but in playing the part of a man uh, for a family a man in your church and the man in the nation and I want to say without jumping into anything political amen uh, we had a good political discussion without getting into anything political I, I I want to say this very clearly, that those are three separate institutions that God has ordained. My responsibility to my home is not the same as my responsibility to my church. My responsibility to my church is not the same as my responsibility towards my government. Uh, there are three separate institutions, three separate stewardships, but as a man, I have a role to play in all three, a different role, but a role nonetheless, amen, that will involve leading and guiding and protecting, amen. And so God's interested uh, in you and I as men. God's made us uh, to be leaders. Now, when a man loses his masculinity, 
he loses his ability to lead uh, to God and to guard in the manner in which God meant for those institutions to be led and guarded and taken care of. Amen. And so we don't want to lose uh, that which God has created within us. All right. So God's looking for just guys that'll be men to start with. Now I want to focus on the spiritual side because because there are there there's another part of of, of men in America uh, who 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 would define themselves as men who would not be effeminate. You know, I mean, they're the old redneck. Hey, they got the pickup truck. Hey, Amen. The shotgun in the back. Maybe even a flag, a Confederate flag. You know, I'm a man's man. All right, and all this kind of. I go deer hunt. Hey, Amen. And I got. You know, and all this kind of, okay, you know what I'm saying? They, you know, and they would say, I'm a man's man. But as, even as we look across men that cause us, well, look at me, I'm a man, all right? They're not spiritual men. God, now, if, if we're going to be spiritual men, we've got to start by being a man, all right? And so I tried to cover that in the introduction, but I want to talk about spiritual men this morning, godly men, faithful men, what, what it means, what, what God's looking for. And I want to give you a simple outline. If you want to write it down, you can. Uh, that'll help you to remember this. And uh, I'm going to use S's. So I'm going to keep it alliterated and use S's so it's easy for you to remember, all right? So real basically to start with, if you're here and not saved by God's grace, God needs you to become a saved man, all right? Uh, if, if we're going to be a God, Godly man. He said, help, Lord, the godly man ceaseth. Well, the way we have a revival of godly men is first to have men become regenerated, all right? They need to become saved by God's grace. And if you're here this morning and you've never been saved, and I'll, I'll talk more about that in the morning service, but you need to be saved, all right? It takes a man to humble himself before God and admit that I'm wrong. It takes a man to humble himself before God and admit I'm a sinner. It takes a man to own up to his own sin. Amen. And confess it. When I was a kid, my dad, my dad, he was a he was a disciplinarian, and 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 boy, he'd come in the house, and those three boys and two girls, and invariably there were there were there, there were times we got in trouble, all right, and there were times when dad would make a statement along these lines: I, I need one of you to fess up like a man, all right, and uh, and 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 I'm saying that it takes a man to humble himself before God and say, I'm a sinner, and I'm hopeless, and I'm helpless. I cannot save myself. I need. I need God in my life. I need Jesus Christ to be my Lord and Savior. It takes a man to do that. And God needs you and I to be saved. And I'm going to explain why. Uh, and again, I'm, I'm not going to talk so much about getting saved right now, uh, but, uh, but, but about the benefits of being saved and what God wants to do with you once you are saved. And I'll speak more to the, the uh, getting saved for a part of the morning service, Lord willing. But if you're going to be a godly man, young man, if you're going to be a faithful man, if you're going to be a man that God can use, then God needs you to be saved first and foremost. Because because until you're saved, you're what the Bible calls a natural man. All right. And I don't want to get too technical here this morning, especially for the younger men here. But uh, we, we have three parts to our being. We are body, we are soul, and we are spirit. Amen. We are tripartite. In our so, so, so what I'm saying there is that we are different than the trees out there, all right? And we are different than the animals. So, 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 so the tree has a body, but that's about as far as it goes. It has a material body. There's no soul and spirit substance to it. Uh, you look at an animal, a little more, a little more progressed because he has a body, but an animal has, if we could say it this way, has a soulish quality in the sense that, I mean, uh, you know, a dog can be a really good friend. The dog has a memory. Uh, if you hit a dog, it'll remember you hit it, and it may try to bite you the next time you come uh, and, 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 and mess with it. You know, dog, I mean, and, and we've all seen vi those videos of those service dogs uh, who've, who've laid on the grave of their uh, owner and, and just laid there, and, and uh, I've, 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 I've seen dogs, I've, I'm talking about animals now, so I've seen dogs crawl up under uh, a barn or, or you know, uh, an outbuilding be because you know either somebody or another dog uh, that they just romped around with you know died and there crawls up and it just crawls up under there and dies it gets depressed or whatnot and and so that's that's an animal all right but uh, but you and I our existence God has created us I mean, they'll teach you in public schools now that 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 uh, there was a dot at the end of this page that exploded and all of everything and all the universe came from that little dot that exploded all right and we got order out of chaos and one day, a little amoeba came out of a little pond and turned into a little frog. And, uh, you know, the next thing you know, it grew itself a tail and was swinging from a tree. And, 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 uh, and, and somewhere in there, we jumped and we have, we have you and I. And I can assure you that I have some ancestors that swung by their necks. But none of my ancestors swung by their tails, okay? I can assure you of that, all right? Now, uh, so here's what I'm trying to say. God created you in His image there's no big bang, and over time, 
And just look at a human eye and tell me that that just evolved. Uh, just, 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 I mean, you know, God created us in His image. Man, I, I'm, when God created me, He gave me something called taste buds. Aren't you glad that God gave... I mean, if you didn't have taste buds, you really wouldn't desire to eat near as much and we probably wouldn't be near as healthy and some of us would probably starve to death, all right? Uh, you know, it might help some of us not to have taste buds, but for most of us, we need taste buds. Amen. You know what I'm saying? Uh, man, we, <laughs> we had steak last night. <laughs> I'm really glad I had steak. Uh, you know, I tell you, I almost had steak buds. I'm glad I had taste buds. Amen. <laughs> to taste the steak, all right, to steak the taste, all right, anyhow, so, uh, so, so God, God's wonderful in the way that He's made us, all right, He created us, and I don't want to say He created you with a purpose, but God created you as a soul, a spirit, and a body, so you've been created in the image of God, He's, he's tripartite as well, you have God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, we've been created in His image, now, when man sinned, our spirit died, and Ephesians chapter number 2, verse number 1 teaches, And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. The moment I got saved by the grace of God, there's a part of me that came alive. My spirit came alive. All right, No longer dead in trespasses and sins, but it's a living spirit, a quickened spirit. All right, I've been made alive. And so God... When God communicates, because I want to be a godly man, that means I want to be a man like God. Okay? I want, to, I, I want to be godly. I want to have the qualities that would uh, pertain to God. All right? I want, I want to be holy. You see, you see what I'm saying? I want, to be, I want to be like Him in that sense of saying that. Now, uh, the way that God helps us to grow to be spiritual men is our spirit's got to be made alive to start with. I can't be a spiritual man if I have a dead spirit, okay? So, so the way that God is going to teach me is through my spirit. So 1 Corinthians 2.14, and I just gave you another one uh, accidentally, but 1 Corinthians 2.14, 13 and 14 talks about how that we're natural men and how that the natural man, that's the, that's the unsaved man. That's the man, he has a body and a soul and a spirit, but his spirit's dead in trespasses and sins. He's a natural man. And so the Bible said the natural man receiveth not the things of God. When it says receiveth not... That that's an old English word that literally, it literally means he, under, he, he cannot understand the things of God. Why? Well, if I was laying up here and my body was dead, and Pastor Dow came up to me and said, I want to give you a steak and it's going to taste good, can I respond? Can I understand what he's saying? No. Why? Because there's one body, a living body, speaking to a dead body, and because I'm a dead body, I can't understand what the living... You come up and say, Ruckman, I hate your guts and spit in my face. I wouldn't even respond. Because I'm dead. I cannot understand things that are going on in life because I'm dead, all right? Now, I want to say I'm not dead, so don't spit in my face this morning, amen, all right? But, but I'm very much alive. But spiritually speak, God's a spirit. God, God is not a body today. God is a spirit, right? And so God works with us on a spiritual level. So just as if my body is dead, I can't understand another body speaking to me. When my spirit's dead, I cannot understand the spirit of God. When He speaks to me, I cannot be, I cannot be a spiritual man. I cannot be a man that bears the fruit of the spirit because my spirit's dead, all right? That's why so many people have a profession of salvation and they just can't have a loving, joyful, peaceful life because the Spirit's not alive. And they're trying to do something in the power of their flesh that they cannot do because it's going to require God to do it through them, but our spirit must be alive. So when my spirit was quickened, it gave God the ability as a spiritual God, He is a spirit, to, to connect with my spirit. Amen. And to begin to transform my life from the inside out. Amen. The, the religion says, man, start with your body and start dressing right and spit and Right, amen. And one day you'll you'll be a godly man and on your way to heaven. And God says it doesn't work that way. It's, it's going to have to work from the inside out. My your spirit's going to have to be made alive, and then I'm going to have to work from the inside out. It, it starts with a heart change. It's transformational. The heart changes, and then it just begins to work its way out through our soul and our emotions. Our attitude changes, and then after a while, our bodies start to change, amen. And some of our habits and various things on the outside start to change. All right. So God, His Spirit works through our spirit. Okay. That's why you need to get saved. You need to be a saved man because you can't be a godly man. You can't be a faithful man. You can't be a spiritual man until you are first saved by the grace of God. When you get saved, you get just like July 6, 1974, I was born into this world. I became physically, I mean, I, I know I was conceived and I was physically alive in my mother's womb, but I was born into this world on July 6th of 1974. Uh, we would say it, I became alive, all right? I, I was born and so it is. When a man accepts Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior, I did that when I was 17 years old, November of 1991, I was born again. 
My spirit became alive. That's why Jesus said, except man be born of water and of the spirit. It is a spiritual birth. And his spirit makes my spirit alive. Amen. And then his spirit begins to lead God and direct me through the principles, the spiritual principles of his word. Let me say this real quickly. Watching my time. Uh, that's why we go to the word of God. That's, that's why we come to church to hear the preaching of the word of God. That's why as dads, we're trying to teach our children the word of God. Because that's how the spirit of God works and moves. He works through his word. He work, I'm telling you, God's spirit don't work primarily through Reader's Digest. He's not going to work primarily through a Christian movie like Facing the Giants. Amen. He's not going to work. Pri he works primarily through his word. Amen. This book is different than any other book. You say, what makes this book different? It's alive. You say, books in your hands alive. It, it, it's, it's not physically alive. No, it's not physically alive. But it's spiritually alive. Amen. This book has spiritual life. Jesus said, the words that I speak unto you, there's another, check out the scripture later on. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life, okay? And so when you get saved by the grace of God, the spirit of God takes the principles of his word and he begins to give you that life and help you to grow in that life and to become a spiritual man. So number one, you got to be a saved man. Number two, you want to be the man that God wants you to be. You've got to be, let me say it this way. You've already heard me use the phrase a whole bunch of times. You need to be a spiritual man. So you need to be saved, yes. And then you need to, now that you're saved and God can connect with your spirit, you need to be spiritual. Now we hear that term all the time, but I want to try to get into explaining what it means. Because so many times I think we hear the terms, but we either forget the meaning or we never really got the meaning. Uh, you know, putting it down to where we live. What's it mean to be a spiritual man? How do we become spiritual men, all right? And so, uh, I already said that we, you have to get saved, all right? But then a spiritual man, what it means to be a spiritual man is, is real simple. Now that God connects with our spirit through His Word, we have to make a decision. I'm saved. I have a free will. Is that right? I have a free will. So with my free will, I can either do my own thing and ignore the Word of God, or I can yield to the Spirit of God. Romans 6 talks a lot about yielding to the Spirit of God. Amen. And Romans 6 talks a lot about our two natures. Amen. And it uses that word reckon. It uses that word yields. Amen. And, uh, and, and so, uh, to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey. So, so there's a yielding or a submitting process. So now that I'm saved, I don't just have the old flesh of James Rutman, that sinful carnal flesh that wants to produce the works of the flesh and the works of the flesh if you look in Galatians ain't, ain't not a good list I mean he, he talks about the works of the flesh he talks about lust he talks about adultery he talks about immorality he talks about anger he talks about wrath he talks about malice he talks about bitterness he, he, I mean partying reveling drunkenness I mean fornications I mean he just gives this list okay so those are works of the flesh those are works that unsaved people are going to involve themselves in because they're not saved it's works of the flesh it's at best what they do alright and but now that I'm saved I have the Spirit of God leading me through my spirit, the principles of His Word. So He's going to teach me the fruit of the Spirit. If I'm going to be a spiritual man, then I'm going to have to yield to the Spirit of God when He teaches me to love those that hate me. And that's the first fruit of the Spirit, love. Uh, when, when, when God says, bless those that curse you, now it's hard for a red-blooded, American, sinful, old, Adamic-natured man, it's hard for us to say, God bless you, when someone just said something completely opposite to you, all right? Uh, and they were mad at you, and, and they were cussing you, and swearing at you, and, and being very not nice to you, okay? It's hard. And, and, and that fleshly side wants to say, I'm going to tell them, and we talked about that last night a little bit, brother, amen? I'm going to give them a piece of my mind, all right? It's hard to say, I'm, I'm really going to pray for them. I one time I got, I was a young Christian, I got a little bit mixed up. Brother Hamry knows a little bit about Hove in South Dakota. I worked at a cheese factory there. And, uh, and uh, this old boy, I've been trying to witness to him, and he just, he was mean. He just, he was just downright mean. I mean, there was nothing nice about this man. Uh, you know, humanism says there's a little good in every man. There was nothing good in this man, all right, towards, towards anybody that was a Christian. I'll put it that way. And, uh, and, and one day he come around, and uh, I mean, he said some things to me, accused me of being a cult leader, just said a bunch of stuff to me. And I'm telling you, I turned around, and I really had been praying for this man to get saved. I mean, I had been really praying for him to get saved. Uh, but... Uh, 
but at that particular moment in time, he said some things to me that just really made me mad. No justification. It was 2 o'clock in the morning. I was tired. And he said something very not nice to me. And I turned around and said, I'll pray for you. And I mean, I was mad when I said it. <laughs> that spiritual side where I'd already been praying for him was trying to kick in. And the fleshly side was trying to kick in too, all right? I said, I'll pray for you. And he said, well, don't waste your prayers on me, preacher. Go pray for you. I said, I'll pray that you don't go to hell, you know. And that was the Christian way of telling him to do something that I really didn't want him to do. Amen. You say, what are you saying, preacher? I'm saying, we all, now that we're saved, we have two natures. We have that old nature that's very capable and prone to producing works of the flesh. And we have that new nature that God on the inside of us, the Holy Ghost of God, is trying to say, uh -uh, don't yield yourself to what's natural for you to do. Yield yourself to what's not natural. That is, be loving towards that kind of a person. So as I began to be a loving man, as I began to be a joyful man, joyful under pressure, it's easy to smile when everything's going good, but when I can demonstrate the joy of the Lord when everything's going bad, when I can have the peace of God when everything around me is turmoil, and the word of the day, it seems like, is drama. When the drama is going and there's turmoil everywhere, and I can have the peace of God in the midst of the storm, I'm beginning to evidence that I'm, a, I'm becoming a spiritual man. When, when you can show love, joy, and peace, and long-suffering, you say, what's long-suffering means? It means to suffer for a long time, and there's nothing fun about that, all right? But when I can do that, when I can be good, goodness, gentleness, meekness, faith, temperance, when I can exercise temperance, when everybody around me is no longer temperate, all right? I'm evidencing that I'm a spiritual man. I am bearing the fruit of the Spirit. And that, that's important to understand. So a man who is Spirit-led is a spiritual man. A man who is not Spirit-led, he's, then he's led of his flesh. He is he's a carnal man. He's a fleshly man. I want to be, and I want you to be, spiritual men. You say, man, preacher, it's hard, it's hard, it's hard. Well, the part that's hard is disciplining that flesh not to respond and disciplining and training your flesh to yield to the Spirit of God. But do you know that you can do that? Do you know a man that runs every day, and we're not going to use a physical illustration, but a man that goes out and runs, when he first starts running, it's hard. He goes out and runs a mile, it's hard. I mean, the next day, he don't want to run at all. Uh, you know, and two days down the road, he tries again. And, but do you know after he's done, you talk to a man that's run for three years every day or every other day for three years, do you know he no longer has the struggle he had at the beginning? He wouldn't say it's, it's, it's hard because he has formed a habit in his life, a good habit of running. And so it is with, with the things of God. Uh, when we come to the, man, there is a great struggle. But when we uh, continually come to the Word of God and, and pray and ask the Lord to help us, and when we continually... Yield to the Spirit of God. Not over, over time, it becomes habit forming. And we find it's not so hard the longer you can come to a place in your life. There, there, there are folks, man, newly saved, and, man, and, and they were a drunk before they got saved, an alcoholic, and somebody pops a, a, you know, a you know, can of beer, and it's like there's a struggle there. But I can show you men that were alcoholics and drunkards 20 years ago, but you could, I mean, there's no struggle there anymore is what I'm trying to say, man. It's, 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 it, there, there was a time when it was a temptation in the sense that it really did tempt them, and then there comes a time when it's a temptation, but it really doesn't tempt you anymore because you're so used used to doing right in that situation and yielding to the Spirit of God that after a while there's a pattern in your life of yielding and you find it's easier to yield to the Spirit of God in that specific area. So I'm talking about being a spiritual man this morning. A spiritual man is a man who is spirit-led, is a man who is sanctified. You say, what do you mean sanctified? That word means set apart for the service of God, okay? Uh, that, uh, sanctification is a part of being a spiritual man. That separates us from this world. The Bible said you look up the reference later. I hope you're writing these verses down, all right? Uh, the Bible said, I give them to you, but I don't want to. I want you to go study it later on, okay? The Bible said, in a great house are only vessels of gold and silver, but also wood and earth, and some to honor, some to dishonor. And God said, if a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor. What's the next word? Sanctified and meet or fit for the master's use, all right? So God's saying, I want to set you apart for my use, now, God's a spiritual God. I want to be a spiritual man. If I'm going to be a spiritual man following my spiritual God, then I've got to physically be set apart for the work of God. Amen. And so he'll tell young men in that same context to flee youthful lust. Because you cannot be yielding to the works of the flesh 
and be separated to the work of God at the same time, it doesn't work out real well, okay? And so God's saying, I want to use you, but I need you to be sanctified. I need you to be set apart. I want you to be a spiritual man, but a spiritual man then sets himself apart for spiritual things, for spiritual activity. Somebody said, well, you know, you talk about sanctification and separation from the world. What, you know, what, is, what do preachers mean when they say separation? Because we're in the world. So how can we be separated from the world? Well, when we talk about the world, when Pastor Dow talks about the world, and when Sunday school teachers talk about the world, we're saying any influence or philosophy or attitude or action that is contrary to God and the principles of His Word. Amen. So I want to emulate God and his word. I do not want to emulate the world. And what the Bible says are the things of this world. I want to, I want when people see me, not because I want to be proud, but I'm trying to give glory to God. I want people to see a godly man, a spiritual man. I don't want them to look and say, hey, Brother Robin, <laughs> he's a carnal man. He's a man given to his own appetites. He's a man that just, he has no discipline. He just cannot say no when temptation comes. I don't, that's not the kind of man that I want to be, all right? And so, uh, that spiritual man is a man that's spirit-led, a man that's sanctified, a man that's strong in the grace of God. All right? I mean, that's a spiritual man is a man that's strong. We talk about physical strength. The glory of a young man is a strength. The glory of a young a spiritual man is a spiritual strength. Amen. We need to be strong in the grace of God. Well, how does a man get strong? Well, if you want to get strong in this world, at some point, boys, you're going to have to quit eating as much and, 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 and drinking as much unhealthy stuff, and you're going to have to get an exercise program going. Amen. And you're going to have to, you're going to, have to say no to that extra slice of pizza and that extra can of Coke. Amen. And you're going to have to say yes to that extra mile of running or that extra 10 push-ups or whatever it is. Amen. You know, to get physically strong, there's some things, some discipline you're going to have to have in your life. There's some things you're going to have to let go, and there's some things you're going to habits you're going to have to pick up. Amen? And spiritually speaking, it's the same way. If I want to be a spiritually strong man, Paul would tell Timothy, check me out. Go find the verse. All right? It's in the book of Timothy. Obviously, Paul would tell Timothy, be strong in the grace of the Lord. Be strong. We can walk in here and say, hey, look how strong I am. I can do 50 push-ups. I can do 50 sit-ups. I can, I can bench press three. Look how strong I am. Well, you know, the, the spiritual man don't walk around saying, look how strong I am, but he, but he is strong. Uh, and it's because he has taken the time to exercise himself, to let go of some things that are not wrong, but they're not expedient to my spiritual development and to my spiritual strength. And, and he begins to spend that time in the Word of God. You cannot be a spiritual man if you're not... If, if, if you, let, let me just give you the two sides of the coin here. If you're sitting here this morning saying, I'm the most spiritual man here, <laughs> you're not. All right? And you just told on yourself. If you think, yeah, I'm, I'm the guy that's got it. Boy, I got it going the best. I got it going. I, man, hey, there's nobody. If everybody in my church was just like me, what kind of a church would this church be? It wouldn't be a good church. <laughs> All right? If that's our attitude, okay? A spiritual man doesn't walk around strutting his stuff. He's humble. He's contrite, okay? But at the same time, a spiritual man spends much time studying to show himself approved to God. A spiritual man learns the ability and has his spiritual senses exercised to discern what's right and what's wrong, to make the right choices. Amen. He has the ability to be able to bring to naught uh, the words and the mouths, to stop the mouths of the gainsayers. Amen. He has the ability. Could you take, I'm just asking you, could you, do you have the ability right now, spiritually speaking, to be able to take the Word of God and show Jehovah's Witness why their doctrine is wrong from God's Word? Do you have the ability to lead a Roman Catholic man or a woman to Jesus Christ, even for from and I don't, I don't, I never use their Bible to lead them to the Lord. But but you could take their Bible. I'm, I'm I, I've, I've taken and, and, and opened their Bible. And look, could you take their own Bible? If 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 in the lack of your good old King James Bible, if you're witness to a Roman Catholic and, and I've had this happen and he's pulled out his Bible and he said, here's what mine and, and I found myself without my copy of the Word of God on me. Could you take his Bible and say, look what your Bible says right here in John six. Look what your Bible says and just begin to go down through. Could you do that? I, I, I sat in a Catholic man's home one time, and, and he said, Le leave the Bible. I said, I can't leave the Bible aside. He said, I want you to prove from my catechism why, why my church is wrong. I said, be glad to do that. Amen. And I took his catechism and showed the contradictions in his own catechism to prove to him that the authority that he would, because he was resting his authority on that catechism, to prove that it was wrong, that it was flawed, that it contradicted itself. I'm, I'm asking you, could you take, the, this morning, could you take a Mormon, could you take a Muslim, could you take and show them the principles of God's Word, how to be saved by the grace? 
grace of God. If someone come to you and said, why well, should I listen to this kind of music and not listen to that kind of, could you take the Word of God and show them why? Because God said a spiritual man has a sense of exercise to be able to discern what, you know, good and evil, amen? Could you say, this is why this music is right and this is why this music's wrong. This is why this uh, particular activity is, is ungodly and worldly. This is why this is spiritual. Could you do that? I'm asking if if you're a spiritual man, amen, are you strong in the grace of God? When we talk about the grace of God, we're not just talking about that, that quality of God, that attribute of God, God's riches at Christ's expense. That, that, that's not just what we're talking about there, amen. The grace of God speaks of the influences that come from the Word of God into our lives. When it says be strong in the grace of God, are you strong in godly influences? Amen. Are you strong in the Word of God is what I'm asking you. All right? And so God's wanting you to be a spiritual man. He's wanting you to study, to show yourself approved unto God. A work... What's the next? What's the next? Workmen. Workmen. Right, workmen. God's wanting you and I to be men. Right, workmen. Uh, uh, laborers. Toilers in the Word. Uh, so that we're approved unto God. So I'm asking you this morning, are you a spiritual Man, God wants you to be a spiritual man, all right? And then, I don't have time to get into it, but sober men. God wants you to be sober. I'll just give you Webster's definition real quick. Webster's definition of the word sober-minded is having a disposition or temper that's habitually sober, calm, and temperate. In other words, do you operate by your passion, by your pride, or do you operate by the Spirit of God who is not going to act in an intemperate manner. Amen. In other words, do you keep your spirit, your attitude, your actions, do you keep them checked? Are they under control? You know, we look at the word sober and we say, well, that man, he's not sober. Well, we're looking at a man who's drunk. We're looking at a man who could not say no, who could not be disciplined. Next thing you know, he starts drinking. The next thing you know, he's losing control of himself and he's doing things that a sober man would not do. I'm saying God wants us to be sober-minded in the sense not just when it comes to drink, but when it comes to anything. God's saying, I want you to be able to keep yourself under control. I want you to be able to keep your attitude in check. That's what the Lord's saying. Let me give you this. This is really... I wish I had time to get the last two, but I, but I do want to get to this one out of the last two. The last two points would be stable men and serving men. I really wanted to get to serving men and talk about some servant leadership, uh, but I can't, I can't. I'm not going to have the time, but, but I want to focus on stable men just, just for a moment because we are living in a generation uh, where we have a great famine of men that are stable, men that are even killed, just stable. You can just count on them. God wants you, guys, God wants, boys, God wants us to be men of our word. He wants us to be, if, if, if we say we're going to do something, we're going to do it. He wants us to be stable in the sense that if we uh, uh, start something, we're going to finish what we started. Amen. God wants us to be stable. That's the kind of man He wants us to be. I'm thinking real quickly here. In the Old Testament, check me out. It's in Genesis. Jacob is talking to his 12 sons, and he says to Reuben, Reuben, Reuben. He come to get a blessing from his dad. He didn't get a blessing. He said, Reuben, unstable as water. Is water very stable? <laughs> no. He said, unstable as water, thou shalt not excel. Do you want to have an excellent marriage, married guys? Do you want to have an excellent home? Men, do you want to have an excellent church, a church that excels above others, amen? Do we want to have an excellent nation? We're going to have to be stable. We're going to have to be stable people. God said in James, unstable uh, a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Well, how, how do we become stable men? We've got to get our eyes, our focus fixed on Christ and the principles of His Word. That brings stability. The Lord said, seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. That's, that's, we've got to keep our focus right. A double-minded man is because he's double-sided. The, Bi the Bible said no man can serve two masters. It's impossible. And there's so much more I'd like to say there. But my time has run out. And so I've got to have the discipline to say, no more teaching. <laughs> It's over. All right. So I hope you take these thoughts and study them out later on and purpose in your heart that you'll be a godly, faithful man, that you'll be a man that God wants you to be. Let's pray. Lord, take now the principles of thy word that we've tried to teach this morning and work them, knead them like, like we would knead bread dough. Work them into our hearts, Lord God, that we might be spiritual men, leading, guiding, uh, guarding, uh, Lord, directing uh, in those areas of life and in those institutions that you've ordained. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.